Um, well, I'm, I'm so excited to, uh, to introduce you to uh, Michael Neal. And um, probably, I think most of you have read his book. Who's read his book? Oh, wow, there you go. There are copies available in the foyer. <laughs> I'll be selling copies of my book, or indeed any book. <laughs> um, I think Michael is, is probably the person now living on the planet that I've learned the most from. And uh, over many, many years... I remember, I was just thinking back to, uh, we used to, when, I think we were both in our 20s, mm. the, and we... John Seymour and Associates. That's right. Yes, I remember it again. Yes. yes. <laughs> and uh, we, used to, we used to teach NLP uh, together back in the day uh, when Michael lived in London. And uh, since then, as you know, he's, uh, he's, he's been on uh, this fantastic journey, and I just, it uh, doesn't seem to be any, any end to... Thank you, Trish. This is going to be a bit of a challenge, isn't it? Mm. We'll have to work out. A... That's right. <laughs> Welcome back, Jen. <laughs> uh, so, um, yes, so I wish you joy in uh, the next day of Michael Neal. I, maybe I misunderstood or miscommunicated. Th those flips, I wanted to point to them. Or, or did, was, <laughs> where'd they go? <laughs> um, uh, so welcome, I guess, would be a good place to start. Um, and uh, you know, thank you for coming out. Thank you for... Uh, you know, Kim explained to me that this was kind of a terrible time to do an event like this. Um, and I explained that this was the day in the calendar I had till December and then into next year, and she said, it'll be fine. So my, I, I appreciate um, you guys uh, finding a way to come out um, so that we could talk, because I think this is, as Kim said, this is a conversation that isn't going on in a lot of places right now, particularly about how do these principles, and we're gonna be talking about them, so if you kind of feel like, well, I kind of know what he means, but you know, we'll, we'll be able to, um, to look at how they impact the way we facilitate, the way we train, the way we lead. And the, the, the thing I wanted to, to sort of begin with was actually just an email I got this morning. And um, this, was, this came through from a CEO of a, a, a very large uh, organization uh, who came out to do an, a three-day uh, Thrive, you know, the intensives that we run. Um, and, and what, for me, the, there's a couple of reasons I want to read this out. One is just to kind of really highlight what is possible. Um, and two is to highlight that it doesn't necessarily have to take a long time. There doesn't necessarily have to have been a lot of specific groundwork. It, the, the, this person heard about the principles about two months ago. Um, had been running a very successful organization long, long before that. Um, uh, uh, hi, Michael. Uh, uh, as you know, when I came to the event, I'd actively decided that I needed to be completely vulnerable in order to be open or even able to hear. And those first two days were so frustrating that I thought I'd share with you what I wrote to a friend. So this is a letter she wrote to a friend. The format itself was open-ended, and the first day started to feel like a therapy group. I got really frustrated and even angry inside, really questioning what a load of crap this was. I was saying, saying, surely you can just explain the three principles? And they all kept saying that it can't really be explained, it can only be felt, and in the, in the right time I would know. Absolutely bloody infuriating. I said that I was here to see if basically this could be applied to work. All through the days, you would continually ask everyone, are you home or away? I said at every point that I didn't know what home or away was and that I was now totally screwed up. <laughs> the second day was the same for me. And at one time, he had me up in front of the group 
and asked me if I wanted to know what he saw. I said yes and regretted that. <laughs> he said that what he basically saw was a frightened little rabbit who tries to control every single thing around her and every single thought and is afraid to let go and discover the world of unlimited possibility. His final words were, I've got news for you. You are not in control and you never have been. Well, you can imagine how I reacted. I said that I found the analogy of a rabbit insulting and this was no better than a psychotherapy session. So this is what we're going to be covering. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> pause for this. Um, so on that third day, I was sort of in shock. I woke up and I just got it. And I can't even describe what it is and how I've got it. But I can tell you that there are no thoughts at all in my head. I feel free and I feel like I don't have to control anything at all in my life anymore. I know that my thoughts create my reality and most of my thoughts are not real. I feel connected to a bigger source of pure energy, and I know divine creative guidance is not something outside of me, but inside of me, and there, always. I know it all must sound very woo-woo, but it doesn't feel like that. It just feels right. And when he asked this morning who was home or away, I said home, and I knew finally what they all meant, and I knew what I meant for me. God, I sound like a complete nutcase. <laughs> But I wouldn't have missed this for the world. And then she goes on to, to talk about how it's still going. It's ongoing. It's deepened. Now, that's what's on offer, right? That doesn't mean that if you don't walk away floating on a cloud, you blew it, or that Kim and I blew it. It just, that's the level of conversation with very practical people who do very practical things that can come from this. And, and where I kind of wanted to begin, the reason I asked him to put these back up is because I was looking at these and I was thinking, oh yeah, I've got all of these. And I wanted to be really clear about that, lest you think that you're going to leave here without them. But I, I think I have a different relationship with them than maybe many of you do. So I sometimes feel drained, overwhelmed, and exhausted by the whole experience. Oh yeah, sometimes I do. Um, but then I go home and you know, maybe have a drink, maybe don't, go to bed, and I'm up the next day and I'm fine. Like It wouldn't occur to me that that's meaningful, that that's giving me useful information that I need to take into account about how I do. That's part of the human experience. Sometimes we get just too much going on and it knocks us out. But the beauty of the system is it's designed to come back online all by itself. You don't need to do anything about it. Right? I wish I had just the right thing in my back pocket, right tool, right process, right question. Well, I do. So that's good. Right? It's, uh, you know, I sometimes call it the well. You know, we, I make a contrast between the toolbox and the well, or the arsenal and the well. Right? Is for many, many years, I collected tools. I collected an arsenal of weapons to use against the people, <laughs> or more like their defense systems. Right? And, and that was fun. Um, but Actually, the problem was you're continually trying to fit people into the tool, to fit situations into the tool. Right? I was a little bit shocked. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up believing in the myth of doctors. <laughs> right? I, I, I did. Like They have studied all these years, and they must really know a lot about stuff. And so I was very disturbed when I went to a locum in, uh, I think it was in Crouch End, and, and so I went into the surgery, and, and there was a, a, a locum who, I think it was day two, possibly day one. Um, and I described my symptoms, and he went, oh, okay. And he went, there, he still had a, a library of books. I don't know which, what those books are, but like, it was like a DSM-4, for those of you who've done any psychological work. And he kind of cross-referenced my symptoms, and he took about five minutes looking through these books, and he went, take two of these and call me in the morning, essentially. And I, and I just thought, oh. Shit, that's, how you're, that's what you're doing? And I talked to some doctors I knew, and they said, well, that's, yeah, and, and it's just that usually the doctor's kind of done it enough times that they don't have to look in front of you. Now, that's not true of all doctors everywhere at all. A lot of doctors kind of tune in and can pick things up at a different level. But it was kind of, that's tools. That's the problem with tools, is, is you're basically making your 
best guess based on your data and other people's data of what would fit something that sounds kind of like the symptoms that are being presented to you. Well, that is better than nothing, but it's not great. And when you start to see that we have access to a well of just-in-time information, it, it's not very tempting to go back to that. You know, I talked to um, uh, one of my first students and, and one of Kim's teachers in this, I know Jamie Smart, you know, he, he, he was, I had a get-together of people that uh, had trained with me, and, and somebody asked him if he would do an NLP technique still with a client. And he said, well, I would if it occurred to me. But I notice with interest it hasn't occurred to me for three years. And that's the thing. It's not, you mustn't. It just, at some point, probably will stop seeming like such a good idea. And if it doesn't, then that's fine, too. Um, so I, uh, uh, I wish I had more. I'm going to keep with the main ones, because to me, some of these are subhabits. I wish I had more confidence, especially with senior groups. Now, in the States, a senior group is like old people. <laughs> And so I looked at that one, and I was like, why senior groups? What are we but but I, I figured it out. Brilliant here. Um, and, and I realized, yeah, on Tuesday. So on Tuesday, I was in Denmark, and you know, we were doing leadership from the inside out. And there were a few CEOs. There was a, um, a couple of government officials, um, you know, top trainers in the big banks over there and some of the big, uh, you know, the biggest firms. And I thought, well, I've had two salary jobs in my life. I drove a forklift, um, which is really fun, I just got to say. <laughs> it really is. I'm sure it would get old after 30 years, but for a summer, it was great. Um, and I was an usher at a movie theater. Don't take the butter, because the first job as an usher is you fish the cockroaches out of the butter, just letting you know. Um, <laughs> And so I didn't necessarily feel on a par with these people in terms of my corporate experience. Um, so I know that one. Yeah. I, I, and, and, and I had that thought. I remember thinking, Phew, boy, I wish I knew what I was talking about. <laughs> um, and then I remember feeling like I had to put on a mask. Now, the only difference that I can tell between me and maybe somebody who put this up as a problem is... Well, no shit. Of course we do that. We've been doing that our entire lives. That's how we got through adolescence. Right? It's just that it didn't actually seem to me like a good idea to actually put the mask on. I felt like it. I really felt like it. But I kind of knew that wasn't going to help. So, yeah, I got that one too. I'd love my groups to be awesome. Or of course I do. That's why I come on trainings like this one. Because I, I do. I know... It's great, and I know it can keep getting great, so I'm going to keep learning. I'm not done. You know, I hope I'm never done. If I'm done, I'm going to change fields. Um, uh, I get hooked by challenging, difficult, or cynical group members. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, it was you, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm the, you know, fuck the other 999 of y'all. I'm going to fix this one. <laughs> right? But you kind of get a feel for it when you've done it a few times, right? A lot of, if you're teaching a beginner's group, and this is not a beginner's group, so it's going to be a different conversation. But if, if we're teaching a beginner's group, one of the things that becomes apparent is when they've run 50 sessions, nine-tenths of their questions are going to be off the table. There's some stuff you just get a feel for by doing. And that's one of those things. When you start to kind of get a feel for it, you just catch yourself sooner, you know? And every now and again, you just blow it. Anyone ever blown a training? <laughs> right? Everyone's still employed? Or, you know, self-employed, but you know, still doing the job, right? It's sometimes you're gonna blow it. Okay, that happens, right? I, I don't, I'm not aware of a profession where that doesn't happen. And that includes brain surgery, right? Third biggest cause of death um, in the United States, just found this out, terrifying, um, is intervention-related death from medical intervention, right? There isn't a profession in the world where they always get it right. Um, as it happens, we're in one where it doesn't even matter that much, right? Like, I'd rather, like, if we were brain surgeons, I might not be quite so casual about it. But it's like, oh, my presentation skills still suck. Okay, it'll be fine, you know? 
you know, oh, you know, we didn't quite facilitate this meeting. It happens. It's going to happen. Um, I struggle with control issues, feel like I have to plan for every eventuality. Well, yeah, that's just insecurity and misunderstanding. Right? That, 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 again, that, that's normal, right? Everybody goes through that. Um, when I first started doing the radio show, um, you know, call-in show, I printed off two to three scripts in case nobody called. Because I knew I'd be fine if somebody called, because I kind of knew enough about the well without knowing what it was. But what if nobody calls? Right? There's, a, there's a guy, I um, can't think of his name right now, but he, he a long-time uh, NPR uh, public radio sh show host, talk radio host in the States. And he, he wrote in his biography that uh, if you want to know whether you would be good at doing talk radio, go into your basement, find a full-length mirror, and start talking to it. Bless you. And if three hours later you still have stuff to say, you're probably up for being a radio show. <laughs> right, because you're talking to a wall, you know, or at best you're talking to an engineer who looks bored, because he is, <laughs> right? Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, I used to do that because I was insecure. I was worried, well, if, what, if, what, if, what if I don't this and what if that? And so it seemed like a good idea to have a backup plan. What I didn't see at the time was it was having a backup plan that stopped me from seeing the well. Because I could go to the backup plan, I did. And so I very rarely got the chance to drown. And it was only in those moments where I was drowning that I realized that humans float. That, in fact, I wasn't drowning, I just thought I was. And I started to see, oh, that's always true. And I haven't printed off a script in years. And sometimes, if you've heard the show, I still flounder, you know? And most of the time, it's really good what comes through that. So I wanted to be upfront about that, right? If you think this is all going to go away, then you're not on the right planet. But it doesn't have to be a problem at all. It doesn't have to get in the way of you loving your work. It doesn't have to get in the way of you being brilliant at your work at all. Um, does that make sense? OK. So, so I, I wanted to do that. The other thing I wanted to kind of put out as a framework um, for our time together is what is it that we're actually up to when we're leading a group? And, and I'm particularly because everyone in here on the whole, from what Kim was telling me, facilitate, train, present, I want to gonna put it in that context primarily. And it seems to me that there are really only four things that we're ever up to. And, and I want you to check this, not just check it with me, but like check it for yourself. Because I haven't presented it this way before, so I haven't put it out to a group. So it seems to me the first thing that we can be um, doing when we're in front of a group is um, you know, information sharing. So we're literally giving them information they did not have before they come, so they will leave with information they did not have at the beginning. right? How many of you, that's a part of what you do, at least? Yeah, it is for most of us. We're sharing information that was not previously there. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, a second thing that we're often doing um, with a group is skill development. So just actually, just to, to kind of flesh this out a little, what, what are some examples of the types of information you guys share in your groups that you want people need to leave with that they didn't have when they came in? You can call them out. I'll, I'll repeat them. Okay, so great. So, so great example. So an appraisal process. What else? Learning themselves. Learning themselves. Learning themselves. So information about themselves, specifically. Because that, that's... Okay, that's not information sharing. So that, I'm going to have a category for that, but this is where there's simply data that they do not have that you are imparting. It's, you, you could kind of give them a binder. It, it might not go in as well, but y you could put it in a binder. That's the kind of thing I'm looking for for this category. Yes? Yeah, okay, great. It could be sharing a theory or methodology. Right, company strategy. Um, 
yeah. How brain works, and that's gonna um, that's gonna find its way into another category as well. But um, anything else, just in your work, in, you in, about the profiles in the room? great profiling, profiles. Yeah. So it's it's data sharing, right? And. Um, Okay, so second category is skill development. Sometimes when we're in a group, how many of you within your work, part of what you do is you help the group develop skills? Yeah? Okay, most people. What are some of the skills that you're trying to get people to be better at? Questions. Questions? Questioning? Coaching? Coaching? Interviewing? Interviewing? Did you say leading, Kim? Yeah. Yeah. Leading. Marketing. Language awareness. Language awareness, listening. And again, we could go on. Okay, so that's another one of our roles as facilitators, trainers. That's another one of our tasks. Um, now, a third thing, and it's a slightly different category, um, but it's actually, um, it's, it, it's, it's an important part of what those of us who facilitate do, and particularly those people who lead teams, this is, this is a critical piece. And that's problem solving. And we could also call it um, possibilities. You know, so sort of brainstorming and, and developing possibilities. Um, so how many of you in your work, at least at times, you're called on, somebody comes with a specific challenge or problem, and your job is to help them resolve it? Right, that's a huge part of our work. What are some of the examples in your work where you're either the kind of problems that you're being asked to facilitate solutions to, or the kind of uh, new opportunities, possibilities you're being asked to look for? Okay, great. Just got to tell you, if you ever get up here, the grape is really nice. Business growth. Right, growing business. So, so challenge, specifically addressing challenges and how they're working together with the team. And let me just take that one because it's a nice way of highlighting the three categories. So there may be things that you share, information that you share about teams, how teams work, the people in the team. There are probably some skills to do with listening and negotiation that will be part of that. And sometimes you're just asked to address. That will happen in the context of addressing a teamwork challenge. In fact, I'd go as far as to say as pretty much whatever you do over there is in service of something over here. So in a way, this is our remit. That's our strategy. Okay. Does that seem fair? OK. So I want to spend today suggesting, proposing, offering up uh, a more effective strategy for addressing that that can include this. It's not instead of this, but it underpins this. And that's the fourth thing that we're often called on to do in our work. And that's, I'm going to write it as facilitating understanding of, well, let's make this really complex, of the human experience, of what it is. You know, if I wanted to put it less like that, I would say of the equipment. It's training people in the equipment that they're going to be using to problem solve, generate possibilities, develop skills, and gather information. OK, so, so basically, in any mechanical endeavor, when I drove a forklift, Right? I needed training. I needed some understanding of the equipment. At the very least, what happened when you push this lever? What happened when you push that lever? 
in order to safely then develop the skill of driving tight corners, the, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. Now, there are, within facilitating understanding of the human experience, there are sort of three levels at which we traditionally do that in training and in presenting and in leading. Okay? And the first one, level one, is uh, the hardware, understanding the hardware. And it seems to me, Trish, that's why we're, right? That's what a brain scientist is helping you do, get a better understanding of the hardware that you're working with. That's what sort a of doctor's doing, getting a better understanding of the, the hardware that you're working with so that you can be more effective in problem solving and generating possibilities. Right? Very useful, very important. Second thing, and I, um, I don't know, I, 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 I'm calling these level one, level two. I don't know this is more important by calling it level two, but it's a different level. Um, is helping people with uh, the programs that the, that the hardware runs. So that's what NLP was. That's what NLP is. Right? It's getting a better understanding of the habits, the patterns that the hardware runs um, so that we change the program, change the output. Right? Garbage in, garbage out. That's the, one of the, the laws of computing. And sometimes you'll do some of the programs that, that, uh, that, that talk about themselves as transformative will, will address the operating system. So they'll, they'll, they'll get into what they'll usually call it the, the global beliefs or the underlying beliefs or the fundamental structures or the, you know, the, it's the deep work as opposed to the, hey, stand like this and you'll feel more confident kind of a thing, right? You with me so far? Well, there's another level. And that's the level we're going to be looking at today, which is Getting an understanding of, of the BIOS, the built-in operating system that's built into the machine that isn't unique to each user, right? So the operating system, well, you're pretty much going to be, you know, Windows or Mac, right? You're pretty, you know, that, but, and then within that, there's a lot of different programs you can run. And there might be an argument that as human beings, some human beings run better on Mac and some run better on Linux and some run better on Windows. Right, just depending on maybe the brain structure. I don't, I don't know enough about that, but I would guess that you could find that. And that's why some people, that's why typologies can, can kind of work. Because if I find out what, you know, how I'm wired, and then I kind of find out, oh, okay, well, this kind of operating system is running, so these kind of programs are going to work better for me, and those kind of programs will work better for somebody else. But the BIOS, the built-in operating system, is the same for everyone. And that's the level of the principles. That's what we're sharing. That's what we're looking at when we look at principles. What is always true for everyone? What's always going on? And it turns out, and this isn't kind of strange to me at least, that the deeper understanding somebody has of the equipment that they're working with, the better they work. Because they work in harmony with it instead of against it. Right? If the equipment works you know, really efficiently, I don't know, I don't have a, a great analogy isn't coming to mind, but like, like if, if, if the equipment works really well when I'm standing on my right foot, but it still works if I'm standing on my left, just not so well, if I don't know that, then I'm going to innocently do everything as best I can, and I really will be working to my full potential for someone who's standing on their left foot. And that one simple shift in understanding, now everything that I was already doing, half of it goes out the window because it was compensating for the limitations of doing it standing on your left foot. But the other half of it is, is, is I just do it better because now I've got the system working to full capacity. Does that make sense as an analogy? Okay. So what Kim and I put this together to, to, to do, what we wanted to kind of talk about is how, how does a, a deeper understanding of the built-in operating system impact your ability to redesign processes, business growth, address whatever challenges you're brought in to address? 
And even if part of what you're addressing does involve skill development and information sharing, how does somebody actually understanding the equipment they're using to develop the skills and understanding the equipment they're using to process the information, how does that help them? Can you see how it would, at least at, at a theoretical level? That's the conversation that we're in when we, we share principles. Now, uh, how many of you have uh, either uh, you know, heard the name of or come across um, George Pransky? So he, you know, he's been one of my mentors in this work. And, uh, and his, his nephew is Aaron Turner. How many of you know Aaron? And again, he's one of the big teachers in the UK of this work. And when Aaron first kind of sat in with George on sessions where George was talking about these built-in operating systems, these underlying principles, he, he went through the whole pathway from uh, uh, very negative to what was it? Somebody, somebody had a great phrase over here about a type of cynicism that sounded really nice. Charles, what was it? Wasn't it was uh, it was no, it was a, but it was a curious, a curious yeah. yeah. He went to that one next, whatever that one was, where it is actually, I am kind of open to it, but don't push your luck, all right. <laughs> and 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 then you know, to actually excited about it, and he went to George, he went, you know, I'd like to train in this now, and George said. Are you sure? Now, Aaron was kind of bent out of shape a little bit by this, because it's like, well, come on. You've been sort of nurturing me along this path, and now I'm saying, yeah, I want to go down this path. And you're going, really? And Andrew said, well, it's the thing is, the level of understanding that you need to have a great life is just a lot less than the level of understanding you need to go help other people have great lives. Because it's kind of like me and electricity, right? I know enough to get around most buildings, right? I know roughly what life switches, light switches tend to look like, where they tend to be, so I can usually find them fairly quickly and make my way around. I even outsmarted the, uh, the latest technology in, in the, the Swedish hotel I was at over the last couple nights, where um, I counted 16 separate switches all by the side of my bed, um, all related to some electrical functioning in the room. Um, you know, so I kind of, I knew enough to spend the night in a hotel room, which was all I needed. But if I was going to actually do more with electricity, I would need to know a lot more about electricity, and not just information, and not just skill. I actually have to have some understanding of how it works so that I could use it safely and I could use it to its maximum potential. Well, it's the same with us, right, as facilitators, as people who work with human beings on making their experience of life better, whether it's through doing better at work, being happier in themselves, being happier at home, whatever it is that we do with them. So I need to understand the human better if I want to do that work. And that's the work that we're here doing. So that's the work that we're going to talk about. Any, any questions that come up just so far? As I'm, sort of just, I'm just trying to lay out the, the ground here. Okay. So one of the reasons I wanted to do that first was so that as we talk about this, as we go into this in more detail, it, it, I don't want you to think, yeah, but when are we going to get to that stuff? We are getting to that stuff because what we're dealing with is the machine that is going to output that. So it is connected up to whatever it is you came here for. Does that, again, do you see the connection? Yeah, yeah great. Thank you, Charles. Can you wait for the mic? So oh. I... One thing I'll be curious about, and maybe you'll talk about this, and maybe I'm just uh, feeling thick and it's not quite as clear, but a lot of some of the, let me put it differently, some of the three principles, things I've been exposed to, feel like information sharing. Mm -hmm. They feel like more traditional training. So I'm curious how you'll distinguish that from facilitating an understanding. I think that's, I think that's, it's not a thick question, it's actually a perceptive question, because that is 
fundamentally why sometimes people talk about this and everyone goes, ooh, cool, or ugh, and sometimes you get letters from CEOs like the one I read out at the beginning. So it's, that, that is true. That is what happens. And a lot of it comes down to our understanding of what's going on when people actually change. Like what actually leads to new behavior, to new output from the system. And again, we can look at that question at a biological level. We can look at it at a programming operating system level. But I want to kind of try and look at it as, as close to a, a sort of a universal human truth level. Like, like what sort of the, the, the as, as deep as we can go with it and still be able to have a conversation about it level. And it seems to me that there are kind of two... Um, well, you know, no, yeah, actually it kind of follows this a little more than I thought it would. But so one theory is that, well, if you give people the information, they will make the right choices. So we need to give people informed choices. If people understood that smoking was bad for them, they would stop smoking, right? We all know how well that has worked <laughs> over the years. But that is still one of the primary strategies used in education. Well, if people knew that this is what happens, then they would change. Well, that doesn't seem to be true. Every now and again, I mean, it's not completely untrue. But every, do, you, do you agree that it's? Yeah, OK, great. So that's a common strategy, not a terribly impactful strategy for creating change. Well, then a, a second strategy, which works actually much better, is that if you can frighten or inspire people enough, that will change their behavior, right? So you, you, you can essentially, um, you, you know, <laughs> there's an old joke. Um, my wife tricked me into marrying her. She, she told me that she liked me, right? You, you know, you, we can understand people's programs and take advantage of them, right? We can find the buttons and push the buttons. So if I'm a football coach, sports coaches are kind of notorious for this. Military leaders, right, are are brilliant at this. There was, I was watching, I don't know if anyone else watched last night, the BBC showed um, The Eagle Has Landed with Michael Caine and Donald Sutherland. And there was this great scene where um, the, the, the really dumb American colonel uh, is, is trying to motivate one of his, his privates. And, you know, and his, the, you know, he says, where are you from, private? The guy goes, Omaha, Nebraska, sir. There's going to be pigeons shitting on statues of you in Omaha by the time we're done here today. Wow, that's motivational, <laughs> right? If that happens to be your button, right? If you happen to be running that program about pride and, and that that's a motivator for you, then that would work. And a good motivator knows that the same buttons don't work for everybody. There's a few sort of universal drivers, but mostly, you know, basically death and sex are the, the easy ones. <laughs> Food is a really close third. Um, but, but generally speaking... Beyond that, it's going to be individual to each person. So that's another way that we try and get in. We, we become good at discerning the program, and then we exploit the program to create the behavior change that we want. Well, there's, a, there's another way that it works, and that's at some point, somebody's thinking actually changes. It simply looks different to them than it looked before. So it's not particularly fear, it's not particularly greed, it's not particularly inspiration. It just simply, what once looked like a good idea no longer looks like a good idea, and what once didn't look like a good idea now looks like a very good idea. So where smoking once looked like, you know, I thought about a cigarette and I thought about the relief, you know, that person now thinks about a cigarette and thinks about dying or thinks about um, whatever it is that's shifted in their brain or just thinks about the taste or thinks about something else, and now they, it doesn't have that same appeal for them. Literally, it looks different to them. And when things look different, we do different. Right? Do you know that? Do you, you recognize that experience? So that's another way that, that change can happen. And that seems to be, from my experience, the most lasting change is when it simply fundamentally looks different. It's not like I've tried to convince myself that you know, there's a... I should think this instead of that. It just actually looks that way to me. I've worked with a lot of addicts over the years, and one of the things that's very interesting is there's a fundamentally different from the ones who've 
beaten their addiction through will, which can be done and support, and the ones who just wouldn't think to, to pick up their, their former drug of choice anymore. It just, it's, it's anathema to them. And when I have asked those people, because almost all of those changes happen spontaneously, sometimes spontaneously within a facilitation, but spontaneously, not as a direct result of an intervention. And they will always say the same thing. I don't know. I just suddenly saw the light. I just woke up one morning and I didn't want it anymore. Right? There was just a fundamental shift in seeing, and that led to a fundamental shift in doing. So to, to take it back, when a, when, 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 when a conversation about the principles is helpful to somebody, when it actually leads to a change in this column, you know, in the problem-solving possibilities column, it's because a new thought has come in. And when we see that, in the same way as like I used to write print off scripts for the radio show, and then as I saw more and more and more that when I didn't have a script, better stuff came out. When you actually see that, it, 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 the idea of generating strategies for the change just stops seeming like such a good idea. And so that's the direction that we're going to be looking at with it. Now we're going to take our first break. I just One thing occurred to me as I was doing this that made me smile. So. Um, so when Kim was putting that thing about P equals big P minus I, I thought, well, I don't know why. This is my sense of humor. So this is IS. Uh, this is SD. Uh, this is PSP. And this is FU. So that's. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to spend the rest of the day talking about FU. And uh, let's take a 15-minute break and come back at half past. <laughs>